Good evening, everyone. This is the first webinar in our spring series of local meats marketing webinars for the year of 2023. Our panelists this evening are going to be Nathan Crow from North Dakota Department of Ag and Rhonda Amundsen from the North Dakota Public Instruction. Uh, thank you for joining us. And as always, these, these videos will be uploaded to YouTube at North Dakota State that's uh, University Extension YouTube page after following the completion of the webinars. So yeah, as uh, mentioned, uh, I work for the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. I am the information coordinator. So I kind of assist producers and processing plants on understanding regulations. Um, I do a lot of food safety training with the Department of Ag specifically for some HACCP and some sanitation and, and that kind of thing. And then I help develop some of the uh, important documents that are required for official inspection and um, help with some of the custom exempt facilities understand their slaughtering sanitation needs and those kind of things. Our program, uh, it's a relatively small program for a state, but we have um, uh, 15 employees. We've got the director, uh, Dr. Groundall, and then we have two senior inspectors. We have a compliance officer, D David Slack. He's the one who who sends out the letters to those that uh, um, might be producing and selling uh, meat and, and don't have their proper licensing or that kind of thing, they get to meet Dave Slack. Uh, and then we have 10 field inspectors, one myself, the outreach coordinator, and we have an admin assistant. In North Dakota, we have 10 state slaughter plants. So those are operating under state inspection. And then we have 11 USDA plants. Direct marketing to me, that means that they, you're selling directly to the public. The direct, the sales of meat um, cannot be sold, meat cannot be sold unless the animal was inspected and passed by either state or federal inspection. Um, ins which means that there was an on-site inspector there who inspected that animal before the slaughter. And then we also watched the slaughtering process and then we inspect the carcasses thereafter. If everything passes muster, then we have stamped that carcass. And then once the carcass is stamped, inspected, and passed, it can be further processed under a couple of options. It can be processed under retail exam, at which the facilities can sell that meat to the end consumer. They'll shop. That'd be like your uh, your butcher blocks, your um, your 3B meats or ordered uh Meats by John and Wayne. They're they're selling meat that was previously inspected. They're just processing it under under their retail exemption. Or that meat can be further processed, further guidance of the of the government, and that is stamped inspected as well. And that can be sold by the pound to anybody for any use. Um, aside from the limitation of State inspected products have to be sold within the state. Federally inspected products can be sold anywhere for any volume, um, for any use. Poultry sales is a little bit different. We do have a uh, um, inspection authority over poultry. Most of the people that sell poultry in North Dakota are actually, they raise the poultry for them, uh, themselves and they slaughter the poultry. And if you slaughter less than a thousand birds per year, you can sell um, those slaughtered birds to the end consumer. And the there's very little inspect, there is no inspection except for just a couple random. Um, there's just a registration with the Department of Agriculture and you just have to keep a little bit of records on how many birds you're slaughtering per year and who you're selling to. And then just maintaining sanitary conditions of when you are actually slaughtering. All the products have to be labeled correctly if you're going to be selling to the end consumer. The most of these people are taking their products to the um, inspected facilities, and they are responsible for labeling. So the labeling will actually be developed by the plant, and the plant is is required to submit labels to their inspector or to USDA for um, to support any kind of claims that are made. So if they say that it's grass fed or if it's kind of humanely raised or organic or right, 
non-GMO, anything like that, that has to be supportable. And you have to have documentation that discusses how that animal was either raised to, to meet that requirement and how they treat the animals and separate those products within the facility so that um, there is no conventional meat that is blended or mixed with the um, meat that is under that claim. So the facility has to have their own separation requirements. Producers that are selling meat under, you would actually get a license through the Department of Health that has jurisdiction in your area. Um, so there's a couple steps to getting a meat tail license. First, you gotta figure out who is covering your jurisdiction. We have the Department of Health and Human Services covers the entire state. If there's local jurisdiction, it's typically going to be a couple of um, county regions, such as first district. Um, there's the, uh, it's formerly custard. I think it's West. There's a, there's a health unit in, in, uh, it used to be called Custer Health. I forget what the new one is, new name of it, but they cover three, four, uh, county area. And then there's a couple of cities that provide inspection and provide, uh, licensing for them. And then you would contact them, discuss what you're planning to do. And typically you are going to be registering for a low risk license in which you can only receive fully packaged meat. You can only store it as a frozen product and you have to sell it as it is packaged. And then you submit uh, your application to them and then you get uh, um, inspected by the local health unit. Here's the, uh, the breakdown of the districts, the licensing jurisdictions. So there's, um, as I as I mentioned, there's about five different uh, health units. The Custer Health actually has a new name, but I, I just found that out today, I guess. And so if you're in the red counties, you would actually just call the Department of, of Health and Human Services and talk to the food and lodging and get a license through them. When you're asking for a retail license, you have to discuss any kind of um, construction and zoning issues that you may have if you are building a facility you may have to apply for local requirements a lot of places will just have some uh, space built into their shop or on their farm something like that but if you have a uh, a trailer you want to haul frozen meat from area to area you can also submit that plan and get a license for a, a retail vendor essentially submit your plans to the to the local health unit or the department of health uh, and human services and they'll review it and if there's a one page document that they discuss and you fill that out it covers what you are planning to do they ask you to at least verify what kind of equipment you're having what you're using for storage and how do you display and then they will probably ask you for a label from your processor just to verify that the label is is properly developed. It has the stamp of inspection on there and that they you can support that you're getting federally or state inspected products. And then they will do a, a review of the your facility and you will do a, uh, um, the final inspection licensing is $110, I believe. And you, or the, each health unit may have a different fee, but once you get that done, you're done. You have your license, then you can sell frozen low risk products. The health departments typically are going to be at inspection every other year. They're just gonna look for product storage, make sure everything's frozen, make sure you're monitoring your temperatures, make sure that everything's coming with the stamp of inspection on it. If you're going to a vendor show or something like that, you, you would have to get a license through each this, um, at the site where that vendor is. If there's another local jurisdiction that covers inspection, such as Fargo Public Cast, or if you're going to Bismarck and you live in Minot, you go to a Bismarck show, you have to pay Bismarck's licensing fees. And usually they have a, uh, a reduced fee. They might have a like a weekend fee or something like that, but you still need a license through them. Call contacts for the Department of Health and Human Services and Department of Ag. So kind of breeze through that pretty quickly. So I will answer any questions or we can move on and I'll just kind of add to the discussion as I need to fill in any kind of the details. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Nate. Nathan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So we will now uh, hand it over to Rhonda Am Amison, um, and she'll take uh, us through some of the regulations that comes to uh, selling local meat to uh, school systems. Okay, are you seeing my slide, Isaac? Yep, we're seeing it. Okay, well, thank you so very much for allowing uh, Department of Public Instruction to help out today. Uh, as uh, Isaac said, I'm Rhonda Amundsen. I'm the School Nutrition Programs Manager for the Child Nutrition Team uh, with the Department of Public Instruction. And I've been doing that since 2018. I was a food service director before that. And so really good familiarity with the rules concerning uh, school meals. Uh, let's see, there we go. Okay, I, I threw this slide in is about the, that it's happy uh, beef month. It's the month of May and our schools are all doing the harvest of the month this year. Uh, we sent them posters for nutrition education in their cafeterias. And uh, this is beef is ending up our school year. The beef commission has been very supportive in uh, sending out aprons and cookbooks and, and branded utensils. I just love it. Uh, but we are planning on doing it again next year. So if you've got ideas for harvest of the month, for nutrition education in the schools. We'd love to have your ideas. And our uh, email is DPI CNFD, and that stands for Child Nutrition and Food Distribution at nd.gov. And I'll give that a little bit later in the slides as well. So I have three slides on the rules that cover uh, selling local meat to the schools. And the first one is that our schools have to follow proper procurement. We have three levels of, of purchasing that the schools have to comply with. And this is all in the federal code because they're using federal dollars to purchase uh, their items. So the first level is a micro purchasing. So anytime they purchase $10,000 or less from a vendor, and I think that will be what they're using for most local meats in our rural small schools. Uh, we call this a spread the wealth procurement type where the school can uh, go out and search for the product that they're looking that they need to use in their school menu, uh, but they need to find all the businesses that are available to <clears throat> send that in. Uh, it, for them to procure and then they need to rotate through those uh, businesses in in our uh, example of local meats they may have found two producers within the geographic location that they're looking for uh, that can provide their, them the ground beef or whatever meat they're looking for and they need to rotate, they need to spread the wealth, uh, the federal dollars between those businesses. We have the second tier that's between $10,000 and $50,000 uh, purchased with a vendor. There, we need three bids and a buy, where the school needs to put together their specification for what they're looking to buy, and then seek a quote from at least three different places for that item. And there, in this mid tier, they're required to go with the lowest purchase price uh, for uh, this item that they're going to purchase. Then we have the last, the largest amount spent with any business is over $50,000. At the federal level, it's $250,000. Uh, but North Dakota's is much more restrictive. So over $50,000, uh, the school needs to put out a formal request for proposal. The, in this uh, type of procurement, they, they need to consider price, but it's not the only thing that they're considering in this proposal. But I think for the most part, it's going to be that micro purchase spreading the wealth that we'll use with most of the local meat purchases. 
the school also must put together that specification and uh, usually we see for a, a meat and it's usually a ground meat being used in a school they'd love to use a roast or or tips or whatever you could provide them but uh, our our budget is is pretty uh, skinny. And so for the specification, we're looking for a meat to fat ratio. For ground beef, it's usually an 85-15. And I'll explain a little more about why we use the 85-15 a little bit. Uh, USDA foods, the, it comes for our commodities as packaged as 10 pound chubs on four to a case that can be definitely negotiated. I think there's quite a few uh, schools that are looking for smaller amounts so they're not wasting as much meat when they uh, only need five pounds and here they're opening up 10 pound uh, chubs for uh, their recipe. Uh, they might put in 100% meat, no additives, organic, uh, things like that. Uh, definitely negotiable, but uh, the school needs to write the, the specifications. So that's one of our school rules. The next one is the food safety aspect. Uh, and uh, Nathan and I learned quite a bit from listening to uh, all of the process in the inspection. I am the one that reads all the health uh, inspection reports for schools. And the health inspector has caught a couple schools that have been using some meat that does not have this USDA or state inspected stamp on it. <clears throat> and that's one of the things that we need. Now, I didn't realize there were several levels of inspection, but whatever comes into the school has to have this inspection stamp on it. The school also has some receiving procedures that they need to uh, make sure they're doing. And one of the things isn't necessarily in the federal regulations, but you're gonna have some frustrated cooks if you try to show up between about 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. when they're trying to serve lunch. Uh, uh, definitely had some of that in the kitchens that I oversaw when a delivery driver would show up and try to get their invoices signed and, and people are running around trying to get hot food on the plate for the kids. <clears throat> uh, you need to find a mutually agreed time. We're also looking for clean containers and packaging. And I'm thinking more of the local foods from the <clears throat> fresh produce side, but we also need packaging that doesn't have blood on it and that any tubs that you're bringing these packages in are clean uh, when they're coming into the kitchen. And this cook is required to tamp any item that's coming in that's supposed to be in the cooler or in the freezer uh, so that she can record that as part of her HACCP process for receiving food. The last rule that I wanted to look at for schools in the use of local meats is our federal meal pattern. Uh, schools are very strictly uh, <clears throat> regulated on what they have to serve to the kids for each one of the meals. It's in the code of federal regulations. And so uh, th there is an option to serve meat at each meal, but breakfast and the after school snack program, meat is an option, it's not required. Where lunch, meat is required daily. <clears throat> and our kindergarten through eighth grade must be uh, offered a minimum of one ounce of meat daily. And our high school kids, the ninth through 12th grade, need a minimum of two ounces of meat daily. Now, they are being offered these things, uh, particularly at the high school level. Uh, you have to have this menu, but the kids don't have to take meat. They don't have to take milk. They need to take three of the food components that are offered, and one has to be a half a cup of uh, vegetable or fruit. Uh, so meat may or may not be on their plate, but they have to be offered it anyway. Another little rule about meat in our 
program is that any one meat type can only be served three times in a week in a normal five day school week. So every year we'll get one or two phone calls from people saying, can you make that school stop serving so much chicken? And as long as they're only serving it three times a week, uh, they're okay. They're following federal rules. Now, they could be serving pork. They, we're hoping they're serving quite a bit of beef to support North Dakota producers. Uh, and then we have meat alternates in the form of our nuts and nut butter, uh, the cheeses, your yogurt, um, cottage cheese, even eggs are all considered in that meat alternate and can be served up to three times in a week. <clears throat> then the last rule that I wanted to just uh, shine a light on is the standardized recipes that must be used in the schools. These recipes uh, need to identify the exact ingredients that the cook is using, the equipment, the process for putting the dish together, and then the calculation of how much meat or fruit, vegetable, or grain is in each serving. And uh, I bring that up in that if this is a hamburger dish, most of our standardized recipes are based on the 8515 ground beef. And if you're using something like a 937 meat to fat ratio, that'll change the amount of meat that's in each serving. Now, it's an easy calculation, but it is another step that they would have to go through. Uh, but we, we can get that done for you if that's um, what you guys agree on between producer and this uh, school kitchen. I wanted to uh, tell you that we do have a new farm to school specialist on staff now. She should have been here today, but she's already up and running with her programs. And I think she's in Fargo with a garden uh, class tonight. And so uh, Amanda Olson is that new specialist. She came on board in February. Her uh, job objectives are to be a liaison between you and the schools to try and help uh, train our food service directors as well as farmers get you both on the same page so that you can get the deal done. Uh, she's got a lot of events planned. She's got resources out on our website already. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to point out that she's also working with the daycares and that would be another market for you, a small market, but it definitely is uh, a market for local meat is the daycares. Now her uh, contact information, if you want to email her is amolson at nd.gov. Uh, and her contact, or you can uh, email our office or call our office, where you will also find another set of teams along with myself that can help you with any school contact information. If you're working with your local school, you probably know the food service director or the superintendent, even the school board members uh, have influence on what's served on the menu. Uh, but if you're looking at expanding your marketing area, give us a call and we can get you uh, the contact information for the administration and food service director of any of the schools. <clears throat> and finally, I wanted to mention that in the recipe development, I'd love to see each one of you putting together your favorite farm a recipe, your favorite family recipe that you're using your farm products in, in, and you could send that to me or any one of our team and we can help scale that recipe up and get it in a form that the school could use and do that calculation with how much meat is uh, in each one of the servings of your recipe. And then you could use that as a marketing tool to your school. So just thought that would be something helpful for you as producers. So that's our farm to school program. I needed to put our non-discrimination statement in to say that we don't discriminate against anything uh, for our school meal programs. And then our website, if you go to nd.gov, the website, 
Uh, we're underneath the uh, government tab in state agencies, Department of Public Instruction, and the tab districts and schools will get you to the child nutrition website where the farm to school tab has a lot of great uh, resources. And I know, Nathan, that you have a new person on staff, too, who's really updating your website on the Department of Ag uh, for local foods and that we can tie those together. So thank you very much, Isaac. I really, again, appreciate being here and uh, uh, helping out with this presentation. Awesome. Uh, I really appreciate you and Nathan both joining us this evening. Uh, uh, you guys did a wonderful job covering uh, regulations and then also a uh, different way to get uh, local North Dakotan produced meat out into uh, our communities. <laughs> uh, now, we'll be opening up for questions and you can either uh, submit through uh, webcam and ask out loud or we will take them through chat if you don't have a webcam or don't feel comfortable speaking. Uh, in other states, they've uh, regionalized things so that you don't have to get county to county permits. Is there yeah. a movement uh, underfoot in North Dakota to get that uh, established so that you're not um, sort of taxed out of the... Uh, you know, food trucks and other things really have a tough time going county to county because of all the fees. Is there a movement to get that regionalized? Um, well, no, there, I just talked to the Department of Health and Human Services today, and uh, we were just discussing that there is a bit of a fractional uh, division between their jurisdictions, but um, they're, they're not really looking at uh, each covering each other's territory. So they're, we're kind of focusing on what they do in their area so that everyone know in your county knows what you need. But yeah, when you start moving from area to area, then it can be a bit of a, um, it can be a bit more um, difficult to kind of parse the uh, requirements. But like I said, it, it's pretty simple to just call up those, those uh, help units and just see. I don't, some of them may have just a weekend pass and it's not terribly expensive. But and if you're in any of those red counties, one one license will cover you for any one of those red counties. So that Department of uh, Health and Human Services does cover probably 85 percent of the state. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, does anybody else have any questions uh, for Nathan or Rhonda? Uh, Rhonda, is there a, a movement underfoot for uh, other alternatives such as lamb or goat in the school systems? <laughs> I was just talking to Isaac before we started the webinar that I have only tasted lamb one time. Uh, I don't know that it's even available on our uh, school food ordering system. So uh, local foods would be great to get into the school so that everybody uh, will have that taste as they're growing up and and uh, develop the market that way. So in answer to your question, there's not a movement, but that is something that Amanda could help out with, I think. Well, I have a recipe that uh, is for <laughs> lamb non. And uh, it only includes about four bottles of red wine. <laughs> <laughs> that would have to be uh, above junior high then? Uh, probably, uh, <laughs> okay. yeah. Right. It cooked well so that the uh, wine disintegrated. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Hoffman over here in the chat uh, for Rhonda. What feedback have you had from school districts, producers, and youth with increased North Dakota local meats? You know, that the kids are definitely noticing when they are getting local meat in the school. I, I remember 
when I was a food service director, I always hated making the fish, having a fish day, because you could smell that through the whole school. Well, you can smell local meats. Isaac, you and I were talking earlier about the different flavors, almost different textures of local animal meat versus what you're getting off of the distribution trucks or even in the commodity uh, program. And so the kids are definitely noticing it. Uh, the kitchen staff notice it. They, they uh, have done some internal studies where they're getting better yields off of locally sourced meat versus what they're getting in from commodities. And the school staff are much happier with it as well. So it's a great program. I hope we can keep it rolling and, uh, and growing. Thanks for the question. Hmm. Uh, that was a good question. Uh, I guess uh, one of my questions would be what, what tips would you have for producers to uh, reach out to their local school districts? Uh, does, do they just cold call or uh, what, what would be the best method and route to go about that? You know, first of all, if the producer has not contacted their local school, they, that would be the first step. And I would bet they know somebody in that school, whether it's the janitor or the school board member or the superintendent or even a teacher and uh, get that step moving into the school. Cold calling works definitely and you'll have to do that uh, with those schools that are outside uh, your area. But uh, as I said in the presentation, we have all that contact information. So if you want it, uh, please give us a call and, and we can uh, hook you up with that information. Uh, but yep, it first is to uh, find out who you know in the school district and, and start from there. And uh, we are trying to help our uh, cooks and the school nutrition professionals understand the process of procurement uh, of using local meat. They haven't used it in a very long time uh, because of pricing. Uh, commodities, they were uh, always uh, way easier to click a button with the commodities rather than go out and try and find the processing facility that was would be able to uh, provide them the amount of meat they need over the school mm -hmm. year. Uh, so yeah, getting finding who you know in the school is first, but then I think you can uh, do some cold calling with the school cooks. Awesome. Um, it looks like we have another question from Dr. Hoffman in the chat. Uh, Nathan, who should we best contact if we want to develop an on-site harvest location for North Dakota Dep Department of Agriculture? Is that a possibility for licensing? So, as far as uh, if you're going to sell meat, it has to be slaughtered at a state inspected facility. So that is directly covered under my or the division that I work for. And I am typically the first call that I, I receive those first calls on people having just the no level of understanding where to start. And I help them start from there. And we discuss facility. We discuss paperwork. We discuss um, any of the licensing requirements with the health. Uh, units, which if you're just selling inspected product, you don't need it, but if you're going to sell retail, um, and then I also help kind of facilitate, you know, when you're looking at building a facility, you're also going to be talking to the sanitarian in your, in your local uh, um, county to talk about wastewater management. How are you going to handle your butcher waste? You have to have that properly taken care of. So I cover a lot of that, converse, that, that initial conversation and get you all those documents and understanding of where to go with that. And then kind of give you your homework, what you need to kind of look into. And, and then I help, um, especially if you're going to do on-site for inspection. That's where I really get involved with the food safety training. I do one-on-one um, -on -one half of training, uh, sanitation, standard operating procedures, GMPs. I cover all of those as well so that we get the basic understanding of where to start. And then uh, at that point, we, we get you introduced with the senior inspectors and they cover the rest after the building. They do the facility review 
they look review those plans and then uh, once everything's up and running then it's you and the inspector and then you're off you're under inspection making a slaughtering and processing so it is a possibility for sure and, and i'm more than happy to have those conversations and, and talk through everything required from the ground up oh. Uh, th thanks for that answer, uh, Nathan. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, don't hesitate to speak up or send send a message in the group chat. Uh, got two phenomenal individuals here to answer questions from everybody. Um, oh, we got another one in the chat. Nathan, North Dakota has developed the broker option for meat processing plants. This is new to processors. Could you explain how the relationship with producer to consumer could be more convenient? So the, the broker, it's essentially a if if somebody wants to buy a half an animal and they don't know any producers, they I don't know, I don't know the front end of a cow from the back end of a cow. I don't, I'm gonna go to my butcher. And the butcher, he typically has a good relationship with several producers that he knows. He knows how to judge his carcasses. So he knows who's got good meat. And so the consumer customer can go to the butcher, give him the, the, the money and say, can you go find me or source me a, an animal, which is purchased then live with that money. And then they provide that slaughter service. So the broker service is more of a, um, a custom exempt option. But it certainly could work for um, even for schools. If, if, if a school wants to go to the butcher and say, I want to purchase local meats for whatever event, they can go to them and they can find a producer who's got excellent quality and purchase that animal and make that deal. So that's kind of a, a good relationship is working with your processor, the butcher, because um, Everything has to go through either a state or, or state or federally inspected slaughter facility. So that's kind of the limitation of a lot of producers is they've got a few animals and they can't get a processing slot. So that's number one thing. If you're not doing a lot of volume, you got to plan ahead. You got to get into a, um, a state or federally inspected processor who's willing to do some of that um, and, and go through processing inspection too so you have finished fully inspected product so um it, it, it is a conversation to have with your state inspected processing or your federal inspected processors all right um i actually have a question building off of that yep. um so when a lot of people think of buying that custom exempt carcass um i i know in my personal experience with people back home they're worried about having to buy a whole cow or sure. a whole lamb um, can you explain the uh, regulations on that breakdown that they don't have to necessarily buy a whole animal? Yeah. Um, so prior to slaughter, that animal has to be sold to the owner. It does not specify how many owners that, that animal has to have. So most places will do halves, but if you don't want to do halves, we have seen broken down to quarters is very popular or even down to eights processor gets a little like, I don't know, eights is kind of a lot of, to juggle. So typically you're gonna be at quarters and then you'd actually have one animal with four owners and that's perfectly fine as long as that animal was paid for, the producers paid for that animal on its live weight before the slaughter, that now belongs to four di different owners. And then they can go to any processing facility under custom and uh, process for their, to their cut specification. And so I, Going further on that, um, yep. um, one question I've gotten at extension events is uh, you have to exchange uh, that ownership title before the slaughter of the animal, correct? That's that's the letter of the law. Yeah, the, uh, the ownership has to be changed. And then typically the, the butcher will get the, the animal and the, um, the name of the owners. So that's when it's delivered. You can... A producer does not have to give the animal to the new person. They can deliver it on behalf of the new owner and take it to the processor and then just give the processor the names and contacts so that they can contact, uh, call up the, the new owners and ask them what they want with their cuts. So, but yeah, the, uh, it's, it's typically going to be a 
two exchanges. One is for the ownership change, producer is going to get paid, and then the processor is going to get paid for this service of slaughtering and, and uh, processing. Thank you. Uh, that that should help answer several questions I have at least gotten in the past. Sure. Um, then I have another question from the chat. Uh, Rhonda, who is it best to first approach? Maybe the school board or who is most appropriate to start discussions with as a potential supplier for farm to school? The school board uh, knows a little bit. Uh, they're actually the ones that are signing the checks to pay for all of this. But uh, I actually would encourage the superintendent, the administration, or the food service director as your first step if you're doing a cold call. As I said, if you know somebody in that school, I would go to them first and see how you could work with the school. But um, superintendent makes all really the big decisions. And when you think about it, using local meat in schools just makes sense for the schools. You're keeping the money in that local community. You're keeping the kids in that local community. So the superintendent is definitely going to be on board. The food service director, eh, sometimes we've heard that they're uh, not as willing to work with the local meat program. A lot of them are, but we have heard that a few are not because uh, they know they can get it easily off the this distribution truck. So it, it'll be a little bit of a change in how they're operating their kitchen uh, if they're not searching out for local meat already. So that uh, encouragement from the administration will be helpful. So that's where I'd start if you're doing that cold calling. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. That, that, uh, uh, good insight. I will uh, second the uh, su uh, superintendent because I've gotten a few calls from school superintendents who call me saying that they've gotten calls about, I want to, I had a producer call me and they want to sell me an animal. And I go, oh, well, I can tell you how to get it uh, inspected, but I, I didn't know that the requirements for the schools. And now that we've gone through this and I've got Rhonda's contact and and Amanda Olson's now, it, it'll be a, a definitely a helpful in kind of getting two together there to make this happen. Right, because uh, custom exempt is not eligible for use in the school currently. Correct, no. Um, awesome, thank you. Uh, is there any other questions that we have from uh, the Zoom audience? Nathan, I'm looking to sell state or USDA inspected beef to my local brewery and cafe. I'm in a North Dakota Department of Health Division Inspection co County. Is the low risk food establishment license application the correct application that I need to fill out? Um, I don't work for the uh, Health and Human Services, but it sounds like the right one. It's it's the um, food and lodging. I just I just contact them, 701-328-1291. But yeah, no, it's you need a license through them. And I think the low risk one is is a requirement for just frozen storage and frozen sales. And then you're receiving it as uh, um, inspected. And then, yeah, you can sell that to anybody, uh, hotels. You can sell it to restaurants. You can sell it to grocers because it has that mark of inspection on it. Uh, you can't further process it. You can't break out packages and repackage or anything like that. But once that once that uh, block of meat has a stamp of inspection, it can be sold and resold as many times as you need to get it around the state or whoever wants to act as a distributor of sorts. Okay. Um, then we had a, another question has uh, for you, Nathan. Yep. Has there been any increased interest with poultry merchandising in North Dakota? And how's that going so far? We don't have much for poultry. Uh, we have we don't have any inspected poultry process slaughterers um, for, for inspection purposes. We've had an increase in producer growers, individuals just slaughtering some backyard poultry, selling to uh, farmers markets. You can do that under the Cottage Food Act. Um, and we've had an increase in direct to consumer poultry uh, for sure, but uh, I'm 
waiting for one of these facilities to pop up and start and want to get inspected just poultry processing and and we'll get them everything they need to know, know to do that so uh, that's again it's the inspection need is is there and that's the requirement so if if anybody's willing to open a facility i'm more than happy to walk them through it well that would definitely be a different facility in north dakota um, right we only have one custom exempt to poultry slaughterer and a couple of uh, larger 20,000 under is still a custom product. But a um, uh, question we have in the chat is with the shortage of eggs, were there a lot yeah. more egg licenses issued this year? Yeah, I've gotten a lot of more applications for egg license. Uh, you need an egg dealer's license to sell wholesale eggs in North Dakota. Direct to consumer, if you're just if you have backyard eggs and you want to sell it to your neighbor and your friends and to the end consumer, you're exempt. You don't need licensing. But yeah, there's been a there's been a pretty steady increase on the number of egg dealers in North Dakota. Um, so I cover that as well. I have two dairy inspectors that go out and do those egg inspections. So anything you can know with egg inspections, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> um what what is it uh what are some advantages of getting that egg license versus just selling direct to the consumer um right the uh the egg dealer's license provides that uh proof of um approved source approved source is the the well, the words the health department requires for anybody to stock and sell food out of their retail establishments so it has to come from an approved source. And I, my license through the Department of Health, the egg dealer's license is that approved source. So that gives the option to sell your eggs to restaurants, to diners, to uh, grocery stores, convenience stores, anything like that. Gives you that marketability of, of, of selling your eggs to wholesalers. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Um, Absolutely. Do we have any other questions? Uh, there's been some really good discussion so far. Um, well, um, I'm not seeing any, uh, we'll give a few seconds to see if anybody wants to join from, um, zo the zoom audience. And, uh, like I said, you don't have to, to speak out loud or show yourself. You can send us a chat, uh, nothing wrong with that, but. Uh, well, we don't have anything currently. Um, it's been a pleasure having Nathan and uh, Rhonda walk us through this and give us some good contact information of who to talk to and how to get local meat uh, legally uh, out to our communities and uh, keep yourself within the bounds uh, of the state regulations. Um, any final words from either of our panelists? <clears throat> I really appreciate the opportunity. It's always good to um, help clarify things so that you know people understand where to go. And, and a lot of people, they just don't even know where to start, who to call, and then they don't get going. So I'm kind of want to be that person to start that ball rolling. So give me a call. I'll let you know what you need to do. Kind of help put out those feelers and who, who you need to talk to so that you can get the, the ball rolling. And it's always good to put a face with the name. So it's good right. to see Absolutely. your face, Nathan. Thank uh, you. Yes. And uh, for schools and remember daycares as well. We are a market for you as long as you go through Nathan and get the <laughs> right uh, stamp of approval. So thank right. you so very much. Absolutely. Well, thank, thank you, you, to you both guys uh, once again. Uh, this has been a we'll have the conclusion of our webinar tonight over regulations for selling local meat in North Dakota. Uh, next Tuesday at seven o'clock, the same time, we will be having panelists uh, go over building a contractual relationship with your processor and some of the struggles and uh, tips that they've learned over the years and what they can give insight to producers on how to develop that very important relationship. Mm -hmm.